So anyway. Hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic to chat with my friends, entertain myself, and bring you information. Um, the, the webinars have just been fascinating, and, and we still have guests lined up, so we're going to just keep rolling until either the pandemic ends or I just run out of guests, which I don't think is going to happen. <laughs> Especially if these guys keep coming back, because this is my most uh, attended webinar, or sorry, that we've done the most number of webinars with, with uh, Sharon and Laura Wilsey. And so welcome once again to Webinars with Wendy. Thank you guys for coming back. Our pleasure. And thank you for running these webinars. We've heard, actually heard from a lot of people that yeah. they love tuning in, and it's so much fun. And, you know, so... It's good that you've done this. You've committed yourself to doing this, right? We, we've been doing something on Tuesdays, kind of similar, and it it's a commitment. Yes. No? Yep. And getting guests. And so I fortunately now I have some help. Alex is helping me kind of talk to the guests and get the pictures and bios and things like that. And she's starting to set right. up more of it. So that's freed me up a bit. But, um, you know, there's so many interesting people. And part of the problem sometimes is the internet connection. So yeah. Bob Bowker, it took me... June, July, August. It took me three months to get him back, but he's fixed his internet. So now, of course, I'm just going to bug him a lot and bring him back yeah. more often because his, his webinars are really, really fascinating. But of course, so are yours. And we always have such a good time. Um, so it's just, it's really fun to visit with you guys on a regular basis. And I, I wish we could do it in person. But until then, this is the next best thing. Well, we are having conversations about maybe doing something in the next yeah. couple of months, which would be so much fun. That would be. Yeah, that would be a blast. So I'll get to work on that and see if we, if I can arrange it from my side and talk to you guys about arranging it from your side. And um, I just think that, that you know, um, that that's what I'm trying to do now is if I'm going to go out, I want to go out and play with my friends, you know, and have yeah. a good time and be with people I really want to be with and, um, and make it fun and easy and drivable. That's my yeah. other kind of criteria right now is drivable. Um, and certainly heading up that way is drivable. Um, yeah. yeah, be great. So stay tuned. We're going to figure that out. We'll post something up once we get get a handle on it. Yes. All right. So if you have any questions for either Sharon and Laura or me, just pop it in the chat, put it in the Q and A. And um, these guys are great because they follow that along with me, so I'm not the only one trying to manage. It. She does. I right. just I just talk, but right. she she actually. Typing. Does the typing. All right. So why don't you guys just introduce yourselves a little bit for somebody who may not have tuned into your previous webinars. All right. So I'm Sharon. And I'm Laura Wilsey. And we are from Horse Speak Planet. Horse Speak Planet. <laughs> <laughs> it seems that way sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we have arrived. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it's that kind of day. It's your, it's it's your background. It's Wacky Wednesday. It's Wacky Wednesday. It's your yeah. background. It's, it's I'm making, sorry. Yeah. It's just the Cheshire Cat. I just, you know, when I was like, <laughs> so you guys to that. It's really So funny. Horse Speak is a practical <laughs> system to understand body language of equines and how we can emulate their body language so we can have repeatable conversations and really dive deep into understanding where a horse is coming from on any given day or any given moment so you can understand if perhaps they might not be feeling that good, or how you can beckon a horse from across the arena to come and join up with you and have a nice time together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's um, based, on, based on a lot of research that I did that was... Are you sure? <laughs> Okay, so let me just say this. Let me just say this. Sharon is probably one of the most observant people on the planet because she's taken the time to sit there and look for really, really, really subtle nuances. And I thought I had a good eye until I watched her. And, you know, it's picking up on subtle, subtle cues, but then recognizing the repeatability of those clues and realizing that it's not random. And I think that that was the key, is that you realize these were not random events that you were seeing. They were repeatable events. And then when you start to mimic those repeatable, you got the same results as the horses did with each other. Yes, you know, yes. And so that I think is just, you know, um, probably one of those br most brilliant things to come down the pike in the horse world in the past hundred years. Personally, I feel that way. Thank so, you. Wow. Yeah. I, I, really I, know. Yeah. I know. Oh, geez. <laughs> Obviously, I can't talk today. So, Wendy, <laughs> take it away. Well, oh, we, we first met, for those who don't know, we first met in Germany at Equitana. 
and we were we they the the Germans sort of boothed us across from each other. That was really smart because we were like American, so, <laughs> um, English, she, English speakers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and she's doing surefoot. I'd never seen surefoot, and she'd never seen horse speak. But she grabbed me and said, "Great, come with me. Be in my be in my clinic." And so I ran into the. I'm like, "What do you want me to do?" And she's like, "Just tell the audience what the horses are saying." Okay. Okay. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And it was, and it just went on from there. It was so much fun. And um, so I got to be thrown off the deep end into what Surefoot was. And I'm watching the horses have these experiences and communicate sometimes even with a rider on their back. And I'm like, well, now they're saying this, now they're saying this. this. And um, from the pattern recognition that I'm coming from, I'm watching them dive very quickly from apprehension, nervousness, you know, 10,000 people looking at them type of thing. Oh no, I'm in a riding ring again. What are we doing? To uh, levels of relaxation and levels of what I call processing. When horses are understanding something, they need to process it through their whole body. And what you can see is that it starts with the face. So you see facial expressions, lips move, eyes move. And then it starts to move through the neck and then through the shoulder, the barrel the hips and finally the tail will do something or they'll kind of shift their weight in the hind end. And that's when they're going, aha. And they may even then have a, an aha moment where we might go, oh, I get it and touch our face. They'll reach down here and rub their front leg with their, cause they don't have hands. So they'll do one of these and go, oh, I get it. So I was watching horses have varying degrees of processing, you know, really quick, which in, when I'm just doing horse speak, we, that's what I'm aiming for too, is to get a horse into a processing moment because that's where they can let go of old baggage and be ready to learn something new or be ready to show up in a different way. And, uh, you know, it was really exciting to see them get on the surefoot pads and that something about that experience was generating this processing ability as well as a lot of subtle musculature changes, which you know I am tuned into and I'm seeing them. I'm not coming at horse speak from a body worker perspective, but you can't really separate them. You know, you if, if you're doing one thing and you have a good eye, you're gonna also see body work stuff. It's it's all entangled, right? Especially on an animal that uses their body to communicate. So that was really surprising and delightful for me. Um, and then Wendy's like, yeah. There's these pads, they do all this crazy stuff. Stand on one. And, and then I, let me try to push you over. <laughs> Let's see if you're balanced, going. <laughs> yeah, that was really fun too. Yeah. Yeah. Good times had by all, but ponies it was, and people. But it was great because I could feel these micro shifts in mm -hmm. my, my own proprioception, which I, I try to stay very tuned into my own proprioception in order to use my body as a tool for communication. And I could really sense the change in myself as my body was going, oh, oh, that, oh, my, my heel, my toe, my this, my that, my something, something, something. And, and you know, be able to stay aware of those things as the shifts were happening and then come off the pads and feel like, oh, I'm moving better, my back's not as sore, things like that. So that, you know, see, experiencing is believing, right? Mm. That, so that, so what do you think about humans using them? Oh, we have a lot of people using Surefoot pads. Um, we actually started to come out with a different label because Surefoot in the human world is so common. We call it Balance for Life. Um, but we've been so busy trying to get Surefoot up and running that we haven't had the time to put it. It's basically the same pads. Mm -hmm. um, just, um, and we have uh, a couple of gyms where they're using them and, and, you know, people in their, uh, you know, over 50 are standing on them and using them to help keep the proprioception alive. Because one of the wow. things that happens when we get older is that the ankles, which have a lot of proprioceptors kind of start losing their job, you know, they kind of start mm -hmm. fading off. And so anything we can do where we're challenging our balance, standing on unstable surfaces is great. And of course with surefoot pads, unlike other human pads, you can wear your, your, your um, soccer shoes, your tennis shoes, whatever shoes you're going to wear in your sport, you can wear on the surefoot pads, which unlike other ones that say you have to be barefoot. So since we're putting horses on them, it's really easy to put people on them. And, and, um, yeah, and that's some, some real, yeah, go ahead. No, that was really neat when you had, you set up your pads in a line yeah. so that we could walk and we had our shoes on mm -hmm. and it didn't matter. And in fact, it, it did give me information about like, wow, I should really get some inserts for these shoes. <laughs> 
but still it's like the pad is doing its job and it was neat to go from pad to pad. Yeah. And it was tiring too, because you are using all those little muscles and the tendons and ligaments are all like firing all the same time. So it was like, as you suggest with the horses, you know, doing a little bit goes a long way. Right. And now, you know, we, I haven't you, told you guys about it yet, but we have something new. It's called the Anywhere Saddle Chair and it's on my Murdoch Method website. And it's a saddle shape that has a ball underneath. So you can put it on, on a plastic chair, on the chairs you guys are sitting on, you know, on any sort of hard base chair. It can have a cushion, but it has to have a hard base. And so your pelvis can stay in movement. So oh, we're spending yeah. all these hours sitting at desks and sitting, you know, in front of computers oh. and home offices. And it's like for our riding, it's just really not good. So the anywhere saddle chair opens your hip angle, lifts you up a little bit and keeps the pelvis in movement and stay, you know, develops more core stability. So it's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, I'm sitting on a yoga ball chair. So that could also be a little exciting. If I uh, sat one of, you know, one of those a, saddle chairs on there, I'll be all, well, I don't think you, can yeah. you know, you wouldn't put it on a ball, but so the ball is so difficult to have in a lot of offices, right? And if you have cats and they do micropuncture, the ball, the gymnastic oh, balls okay. don't hold up too well. I've seen that happen. Does, uh, that hasn't happened yet. With all oh, good. The Knock on. <laughs> Speaking yeah. of cats, someone yes. did ask on the cat theme, what communication is there between cats and horses? And I just we keep coming back to cats. So well, yesterday we had our club meeting, and someone, um, she is in Latvia. Uh, Lativa? No, Latvia. Latvia. And she has, you know, heard, I think there's about six horses, and there was the cat and the dog were hanging out outside the pen, and the cat was greeting the horse. one of the horses for a quite, like, probably a minute. Yeah, they were just over really there cute. touching. My cat, Rondo, loves to go and say hi to the horses. I'll hold her, and Jag, my horse, comes over and says, hey, and yeah. Cats do have uh, a formal greeting with the nose and in from working at animal hospitals in my early experience of life. Um, well, I didn't really work at, well, I worked at them because they made me work because I was there and they're like clean cages because I was nine years old and I was like, oh, broken okay. around. They're like, <laughs> go clean cages. So, but having exposure to lots and lots of um, animals who were there because, you know, they're sick, they've had surgery, they're not well. And it was a great experience to handle animals that are in distress. And I learned a lot about approaching and I think the, the origins of the greeting ritual kind of got in me there because you let them sniff the back of your hand and then kind of um, ascertain if they're comfortable with you coming closer. And that always worked and the cats do have that. I've been able to get wild cats to come to me, you know, feral cats and stuff, or someone has a cat in their house who never goes to anybody. And there's certain body language signals that you can do that say, you know, I'm not a threat and I'm kind of interested in you. And the first thing they want to do is just sniff your knuckles here. And if you don't go past it and try to pat them right away, then often they'll, the next thing they'll do is rub their head because that's they have another signal after greeting, which is head rubbing for acceptance and marking a little bit. So whereas a horse will do a go away face to signal mutual respect, the cat will sort of claim space and say, oh, we can be connected. Or cats who are deciding not to engage will do a go away face. They'll turn their head away and look away. And that's a way to agree, I'm not gonna connect with you, I'm gonna go that way. And I've watched tomcats do that instead of getting in a fight. Mm. So it's really interesting. And raccoons we have and- two yes. tomcats. Oh. And one of them was really afraid of us but doing this licking your lips and blinking and, and nodding, nodding your head. head and doing a little go away face yourself. That was the key to get him to come in. Come in out of the cold. Yeah, Thomas. Yeah, wow. yeah. Both, both of them followed that. And, uh, and then when they would, they'd start to fight with each other cause they were, we had them neutered and stuff, but they just, and I was able to do go away face finger from like 50 feet away at their cheeks when they'd be like, Row, and I'd just say oh, psh, at both cheeks, and they would look at, listen to me and turn away from each other. And then I could manage that space with gestures, like we keep the space and kind of insert myself in the middle. And that served as a buffer so that they wouldn't engage. And I did that a lot. I practiced that with them a lot. And now they sleep next to each other. Oh, how <laughs> cute. <laughs> It only took six years. Yeah, but it oh, was six years. Okay, yeah. <laughs> they got senile. 
<laughs> maybe. But Sylvester, the black cat, he's uh, 22 pounds of sure muscle. Yeah, this cat is huge. And he, um, our littlest cat, Raja, who's your Faja, black and white kitty, he likes to kind of get into it with this huge cat. And we're just like, Raja, so, you're like a quarter of the size of this cat. So we like, have to do that to them as well. But and you know they're cats so they make up their own minds but it's yeah. interesting yeah. to i've had people send me pictures of doing the basic greeting ritual with with goats mm -hmm. with um llamas with we just had a couple bulls show up a couple weeks ago gotta love vermont the neighborhood just down the road they came just came right in and ate came, all the breakfast came in through the woods oh they came through the back forest and broke into the horse pen and she did horse speak with them and it totally worked. So how many species do you know of? Have you used horse speak? That's a bad sentence. Probably. How many species have you used horse speak? <laughs> Probably 18 or 20 species that I've, that I've personally, because I, I went to a zoo and got to play with it. Oh, with wow. As many creatures yeah. at the zoo as I could and it had pretty good results with, I mean, it, it starts to really differ when you get into categories of predators. It's, um, they do respond, but they have other, there's other variables. So in my mind, I'm always looking at where's the middle, where's the mid, like if you think of a bell curve, which we were just talking about, and the two ends of the bell curve are extremes. So one extreme is like extreme hesitant and animals like a deer, I'm not coming anywhere near you. And another one could be extreme, like towards aggressive, like maybe I don't want the tiger to come that near to me, right? So you have these two extremes. And in the middle of the bell curve is like um, a palatable area where I could interact with another animal. It's like we're amicable and we're interested in each other. So what are the signs that you do to say, I'm interested, are you interested? And it, this is it safe to be interested with each other? So there are specific protocols that animals use just for that aspect. And then the next aspect is, if we're interested and it's safe, would we like to greet? And if we're gonna greet, what are the protocols of greeting? And that can change if an animal has horns and things like that, but the mm. baseline is still the same. So I've done it with bison, three different kinds, three different breeds of deer, um, elk. Um, I have not done it with a moose, but I've done it with raccoons, fox, uh, coyote that I Wallaby. saw. Wallaby. Oh. <laughs> yep. That was super fun because then we got to scratch him too. Yeah. Oh, wow. There were um, seal. somebody saying a seal. Yes. Yeah, seal. I yeah, did a seal. Did a, yeah. Yep. Seal. And um, don't forget the seal. Yeah, Adrian. There's um, in the zoo, there, oh, there's kudu, African kudu, and wild sheep, bighorn sheep, and there was all the other monkeys. All mammals? Yeah, mammals. But, you know, it's interesting because we have peacocks and we have chickens and they don't do the, they don't do the frontal greeting, um, like beak on beak type of thing, but they have a lot of the other gestures. So they have the other deferring space gestures and uh, getting connected gestures because they, they move in flocks. Right. And so any animal that has to bond and rely on flock or formation patterns, they have similar systems in place to have Bonding, hierarchy, but togetherness. So the hierarchy is about deciding where you are in the lineup, not sending you out of the flock and right. kicking you out. So, well, if, you know, when birds are flying, they obviously take different roles at different times to alleviate the stress of flying, right? Just like if you're in the lead, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so they would have herd flock dynamics for that, how they communicate while you're flying around how do you communicate hey i'm tired i'm gonna drop back you take over <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you take the headwind i'll go on the tail yeah <laughs> i'm gonna rest back here in the flip stream so so it's fascinating so really what it's sounding like then is that it's really a universal language or it's a largely at least mammalian language and possibly avian and mammalian um and so you know it's it's got to be that this developed so early on in our brain because you know, there was a point when we were nonverbal or didn't have the kind of verbal communication skills we have now that's evolved over time, but we still need to be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's fascinating. It's, I would be, it'd be really interesting to look at as vocalization increased, did this sort of more subtle nonverbal spatial communication decrease, mm -hmm. you know, because when we all people have it and, you know, we all 
use it like the pandemic right now we're all going uh do you have a mask on uh yeah. you know did you <laughs> talk go away face yeah yeah, yeah. Or right? we're, we're doing it's, we're much more heightened in that awareness of our spatial relationships and that communication and you know you walk in somewhere and it's like okay i feel safe here i don't even have to you know I just look around i feel safe in another place it's like i am not safe i'm leaving yeah um, and how much distance do I have? So I just think this is such a great opportunity for us to actually hone those, uh, our awareness to those skills while we're in this situation. Yes, yeah. and you know, the thing is with actually working with the birds, so we have, I have Penny the bee hen, who um, she is hand tamed and I can pick her up and carry her like a baby and all that. I almost thought about bringing her in today, uh, but I did not. But anyway, just um, the fascinating thing is that I heard her similarly to the motions with my core as you would horses. It is so easy to cut off the forward movement of a bird and, you know, and then circling around, using circles and arcs to drive them in the direction where you want. So if you wanted to practice how to do liberty work with a horse, you Get can a bird. certainly... <laughs> get your body language so precise by hurting uh, cats. Yeah, hurting not birds. Cats. Not, not, hurting, birds. not hurting, hurting cats. cats. <laughs> no. Hurting birds, but, chickens. Um, and it's a true flight animal, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So if you're putting yeah. too much pressure on that bird, they fly, they fly yeah. and you can then get into your ninja where you can quickly put your hand on top of them and ask them to not. That She can. I can do that. She's got octopus arms. Yeah. but. Yeah, and even moving chickens that way because mm -hmm. they they sense the the trajectory of your angle, and you could be twenty feet away and just change your core, and they they bank and start to go that way. So it's it's spatially fascinating yeah. because they really clear up what your body language is sending, whether mm -hmm. you meant to or not. And even like the blocking energy, like to even just to like literally block your core sometimes when you have to ask them to not go the opposite direction where you want them to go it's it's really cool to start using your hands and the you know we have to attention. video it yeah but she has yeah to that would be great that'd be great yes, I, wear, remember, I knew you were gonna say that <laughs> you you were at equitana in 2017 but there was one of the my favorite acts was a woman and her daughter on horses and they had um um uh herding dogs um famous herding dog uh, i forgot the name black and white black and white herding uh -huh. dog not border border collies, border collies. Right? thank you it just escaped me and they worked with ducks and they worked with black and white ducks and they it was these dogs were so amazing because you couldn't see them at first and then you could see them but they're the distance by which they would position to move the ducks first of all how much a bigger bubble ducks have than mm -hmm. people right and horses and then the precision by which she could organize the dogs to herd the ducks over bridges and into a car and it you know and so i'm sure that working with ducks and birds um i mean they're you've got to be even that much more aware because they're small animals so you don't have the length of body to be able right. to adjust you're adjusting really tiny little focal points and it's really cool because you know even using verbalization like our birds do know their names so one of them is named Gogo, -Go, and she goes <laughs> and lives with these little roosters that are a little challenging. Little tiny, tiny little bantams. And I've been vocalizing a lot with them and be like, and doing go away face, and be like, you stay over there. Bantams. You get bantams. <laughs> Keep in Napoleon. They're, they're ruthless. But, you know, so she, Gogo, -Go goes and lives with these guys, but she goes into the shelter and she hides like behind this little lip so I can't see in there. I'm like, Gogo. -Go, are you in there? And she go, chuck, chuck, go, go. You know, they talk back. And we have this other one, uh, Spenny, who is Penny's best friend, the peacock. Um, and so Spenny, you'd be like, hey, Spenny, we call her from across the yard. And she'll, and she'll come, come up. running, which and, is really funny. And then she starts talking, chuck, chuck, and, da, 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 and all these cool little sounds. And so we're like, literally these freak shows talking to way too chicken. much about hey, you're a little <laughs> it's all good we're all in with animals, animals. that's it's, just the bottom line i mean speak. we have like 30 animals on the property, but what i wanted so. to say you know in rel re uh, relative to what you were just speaking about um i that's there's sort of two categories of of, br of brain function and one is a hunter brain function another one is a prey animal brain function and we we're we're kind of in the man we're we're omnivores but we have eyes in front and we have 
you know, if you roll a ball, a kid will chase a ball. If you roll a ball, a dog will chase. So animals that are more inclined to hunt will chase, whereas animals that are inclined to be hunted run away from rolling balls or avoid them, but they don't necessarily chase them. And you might see a stallion or a young horse or a fresh horse, you know, play with a ball and stuff, but that's, that's not, not in the vast majority, if you, if you roll a ball at 20 horses, maybe one will engage with it and the rest will move away from it. So the point is that in my, what I've been looking at, what I've been studying is how do horses work out the problems of their world and they work out, I call it problem solving rather than strategizing, whereas the dogs and us, we strategize. So we're always creating bottlenecks and changing angles to get the herding animals to go in the direction we want, whereas the herding animals are responding or reacting to the driving forces that are coming around them and containing them. So the, the strategic thinking means thinking a little bit ahead. It's a little bit of playing chess. It's a little ahead of wherever you are, whereas problem solving thinking is directly here and now, what am I, what am I doing? So if you have a, a prey animal, they're gonna go into evasive maneuvers based on what's coming at them. Not necessarily, oh, if I run through this alley, they can't get me. They, if they come upon the path to that alley, that might dawn on them, but they don't necessarily think, I'm gonna to get to that alley and get away. They're more reactive immediately in the moment to what's coming at them. But the dog might be thinking, if I get them to go down that alley, I can catch them. So they're strategizing ahead of wherever they are. So when you're working with dogs to herd animals like you know over a bridge and into a car as you said then the dog is in some level aware of the end result and we're aware of the end result and that's because our brains our human brains especially can organize with time so we can conceptualize time and think ahead and the her, the herd animals aren't thinking that way they're more in the now and so that, i think like the two kinds of of um, of abilities, it's not like horses can't think, and I think this is where we've gone, we, we've we've gotten confused about them. They do think, and old old fashioned concepts about horse thinking is like horse sense equals common sense. Oh, that you know that person needs some good old fashioned horse sense, right? Which is like common sense here and now, horse problem solving, horsing around. Well, being in being in the moment and being with what is actually happening, not what you think is happening or what you're projecting is, is happening. And w because of our, our two brains work so differently in that respect, that's where humans can get into trouble, but also where the people who come to my workshops and stuff are sometimes you know, amazed at like, wow, the horse really is thinking. And it's like, just because they have a different way of thinking doesn't mean they're not thinking. Right. And, you know, I did a webinar with Lucinda Baker on Monday, which you can all find on the Sherpa Equine YouTube channel. It was a fabulous webinar and she's been studying with you now. Yeah. Um, Lucinda's great because she's looked at a lot of different things and she has formulated this mandala and she talks a bit about how horses um, process information. Right. And, you know, um, it's like a case in point. I set up a pasture paradise kind of thing. I set up some pigtails with electric fence and the horses have to go away to get to the gate, right? They mm -hmm. can't go. And yesterday, case in point, you know, two of the horses came in, Al's still out in the field. He's standing where he can't come in because he's in the corner of the fence and could not strategize. I have to go to the shed to go through the gap to get to the barn until I walked down there. And even then it took him a couple times when he went, oh, go to her and then I can get around, right? So they, they don't, you know, it's like, I thought my horses were smarter than that. Right. And they are. Well, the thing is, it's a different level of it. It's a different kind of intelligence. Right. He was probably, in horses that are the leaders are more able to do sort of process thinking. And I call those the map makers or the mentors because they're able to pull the things together and figure it out quicker and do the, do the problem solving at a faster rate of speed than horses who are more born to be the followers who are like, I, I can't do any of that, so I'll just follow George because George seems to be able to do that just fine. But I'm a good kicker, so I'll kick any coyotes that come up behind. Right. So they have different roles that they play. And that, that's ex what you're saying is exactly it. It's like people will say, oh, the, this horse is acting so stupid. They ran right into the barn. 
And, you know, they ran right into the fence. It, but it's not, it has nothing to do with their ability to be intelligent. It's the kind of intelligence that they have, which is on a different level from our kind of intelligence. Right. So, and, and these horses, you know, haven't been asked to have that type of thought process. They weren't raised in the wild where they have, I think those horses have to do so much more problem solving because that, you know, their life depends on it. Whereas our domesticated horses that have basically lived in secure fields all their life and then suddenly right. Wendy throws up a fence because they need to move more. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and they're like, uh... a couple <laughs> things in the chat. The next book should be Chicken Speak. It's yes. actually going to be Dog Speak. <laughs> right. Dog oh, cool. After, um, yeah. The next, the third book for Horse Speak is coming out, which is actually needs to get named. It's not named yet. It's not named yet. Oh. It will be coming out in January. It had a name. And then when the editor started working on it, she says it's not the name anymore, <laughs> nor is it the cover photo. So we need to uh, get in on that. It'll be uh, the Dictionary of Conversations is, is a, a subtitle sub, or sub subtitle sub or sure. something. So um, it's and then very also, intense. Um, <laughs> yes, our neighbors with the pig question. Yep. Yes, they use when they get their little piggies for the season. They've been using, you know, horse speak with the pigs and have found huge changes in how they communicate. They're practicing they manage with their, their pigs. cows um, right. that they have in the- They are really intelligent. I mean, they- Oh yeah. Have, oh, yeah. But they, they also get really big, really fast and they're razor sharp teeth and they have, so when they manage, when they do horse speak or be pig speak with the pigs, especially the go away face mm -hmm. and especially like um, touching the, what would be the way they're touching the shoulder of the pig to initiate uh, grooming instead of the pig coming up and kind of shoving you with their head to say grooming up. Um, they found that when they do become ginormous pigs at the end of the season, they're just really easy to manage because they've been managing them correctly since the get go. Wow. So, and then horses have vary a lot in how they think through situations. Yeah, there's a variable in there depending on what ultimately what did a what did a horse get um there's nature and nurture so it's kind of what are they born with and then what did they get exposed to what level of mentorship from other horses did they get exposed to so that's one variable another variable is some horses are, are born with more ability to problem solve and the more that we um, understand how they problem solve instead of bringing them for instance to the middle of an arena and say here's a tarp let's problem solve it that's not how horses problem solve. They actually go around edges first. So the more you bring them to the edges of, a, of an arena and touch places, find places that represent safety, the more the horse can relax about the environment, problem solve corners, which is what they're really interested in. Because if you're a prey animal and you get shoved into a corner, you could get in real trouble. So problem solving corners is a big deal for them and being able to go with their owner into an into a corner and say, and are we gonna back up? Are we gonna do it, you know, are we gonna do a turn? Are we gonna do a yield? Are we gonna side how are we gonna get out of this corner? And you'll watch horses just like layers and layers and layers of of stress just go away because they're like, thanks for showing me how we're gonna do this corner. Now I can go to the middle of the arena and have some thoughts. So it's been really interesting just to take it from their perspective. Yeah. And, and that they need time to process a thought. We process, that was one of the things Lucinda pointed out is we can process multiple thoughts in a minute. They can't, right? They need much more time to process an individual thought. And the tendency is that we move too fast and do too much. Yes. Yes. You know, and so the horses can't stay up with that level of conversation. Yes. Their brain doesn't, you know, it's much different than the dog. We're expecting that the horse is gonna have the same kind of acuity and response as the dog. And so when you do ask for, uh, you know, you do turn the key, come to me at the go away face button and point at the hip and you stand there and wait. And you might wait 10 to a minute, 10 seconds to a minute, but they will think about it. You can watch like you a ripple effect go through happening. the tail lift, they'll nod their head and they'll make that arc and come to you because depending on where you made the request you're up and down where's that picture where's that picture of the up and down the horse's body um, you're you are at an angle of proprioception on the horse's body that might have made it really difficult for them to fulfill the request and you didn't know it the other thing someone said corners of arenas are often where toys are kept and they can be really scary precisely 
when you turn horses loose in an arena, they, one of those horses is, is going to go to the edges, going to touch the walls, go to the corners, examine the things. The other horses are going to hide in more towards the center of the arena and watch what that horse does and then follow along and start to touch what that horse touched. So we, if we're the one who touches things first, who says, let's go to this corner, I'll touch the scary. You don't drive a horse because if you send a horse to the scary object, you're saying, you figure it out while I hide behind you. <laughs> you wanna to touch the object first and say, you hide behind me, I'll figure it out. And very quickly then horses say, oh great, any new place you take me to, we're gonna problem solve the corners, look at the spooky objects. You won't make me touch them first, you'll touch them first. And you'll say that this is safe because that's what mom would do. Because when a mom gets turned loose in a new paddock with her baby, she's looking, where, are there bees? Are there gopher holes? Are there bears? Is there anything on the horizon line? Is there anything down low here we need? To, and she's gonna check everything out. And then when she's decided it's okay, she turns the baby loose. All right, go for it. So this is a, this is a, this is a stick drawing I did of possible interactions depending on where you are in the quadrant of the horse. So depending on where you are on the quadrant of the horse, it, you could, by changing your position, have these multiple effects on that area that you didn't intend to have. You might be thinking, well, I just told your face to come here. And they're like, but there's a long neck behind that face with four legs and a whole big long body. And do you want me to turn like this? Or do you want me to turn like that? Or do you want me to turn like this? Or do you want me to actually back up and then come more straight to you? Because those are all possibilities. Yeah, it's so different when there's a, you know, well, how long is the average horse? I mean, his neck is like three foot long, his body's probably another eight feet long. We're talking about like an 11 to 12 foot long being. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're about two feet long. Right. It's where, you know, when you go across the shoulders, maybe, maybe we're two feet, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So it's a very different thing. And, and physics plays into this. Your little drawing, I love, because it's all about physics. It's if anybody's ever played pool. It's a precursor to the third book. It's going to be in there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's all about the, the angle of direction and how that's going to influence where something goes. So if that's the other thing y'all can start doing is play with that pool table and just see how a diff slightly different angle is going to change where something goes. That's and, a good way to practice it. And also... Everyone the, should be playing pool. Well, yeah. another thing <laughs> that you can start going crazy, you brought up pool. This is one of my things. She's is, good at pool. Um, oh. Even the position where you, on the cue ball, where you hit with the cue, whether you do the top left corner, the top right corner, bottom, middle, all the different angles that you can actually shoot from on the ball, actually change the trajectory of how the spin and all those things, the stopping of the ball. It's pool is, you know, such a strategic game and uh, definitely really good for your hand-eye coordination. Yeah. Right. So anything like that where we, like I, I went out to Martha's Vineyard and I did some mounted archery and had a blast, but oh. you know, it's like, Again, where you are releasing the arrow, the trajectory of that is is so dependent on your whole body position and your where you look. Um, and so any kind of sport that starts developing that eye hand coordination toward a distant point. Mm, like cool. being a quarterback in football. I mean, think about the planning, especially if they're throwing the ball halfway down the field. And they have practiced their maneuvers. They know when to cut and what have you. But still, to be able to future pace that ball with the trajectory and angle and all that, it's absolutely stunning. I don't think I'm going to become a quarterback, but I will think about becoming a mounted archer. There you go. <laughs> but it's just, you know, it's just really good to take the opportunity to think about some other activity where the consequences are much less. Right. The thing about the consequences with a horse is if you make a really big mistake, it could have serious consequences. But when we look at things like pool or archery or something like that, where we start to understand those very subtle differences, it, those are always good activities. Horseshoes. Right. Horseshoes. Yep. Right. And, you know, speaking, so with that in mind, the horses don't um, orient themselves the way we do like they don't they don't shoot bows and arrows they don't have a i'm gonna i'm gonna aim for they're they're about the the ground that i'm covering now and my ability to balance myself mm -hmm. which is why sometimes they can get themselves into trouble if they haven't had exposure 
like a horse who's never been on a trail ride is like, I don't know how to balance my, I don't know how to problem solve this. Carrying you over roots, I don't know how to do that, right? So, and um, whereas we're thinking ahead of getting, we're like, I've got the backpack, I'm hiking over roots, I'm thinking about the mountaintop I wanna be on. So, you know, we people might be stomping through the trail and everyone's walking, got a different walking pattern and, that, you know, you might see someone's got a pole and they're walking with this and someone else is just kind of moving on like that because we're less concerned with how athletically we're doing something oftentimes than where we want to be. And it, it, we could be thinking in our minds and not even be connected to what our body is doing. But a horse cannot do that. Right. And, you know, that just brings up a really good point that we talked about yesterday in our club with our folks is that, you know, we have a driving horse. He is, that was his jam. He was a paired driving horse. And then they started riding him with really no preparation. And so therefore he was like, I don't even know what to do with this because his body was used to pulling using the shoulders rather than, you know, engaging his hind end. You can even just see with the muscling of his back and his hind end. Right. Let alone his breeding. Breeding right. and just being used to having, you know, sack of potatoes up there doing something and they're like how am i supposed to move you're moving yeah it's just yeah. a totally different um thing for them to do so it's like the enrichment to change that horse's proprioception and body awareness is you know you basically have to start from the ground floor which is what brought me to the question i wanted to ask you so if a horse has um an injury so that horse did not have an injury but if a horse has an injury because this has come up of some kind what what do you recommend that they do with surefoot pads? You know, the most important thing with an injury is to get a good diagnosis. So, you know, I cannot stress enough how important it is. Like recently I saw a horse and she was lame and they took her for an MRI and it turned out that she had, it was either a torn tendon or a torn ligament. In which case surefoot is contraindicated for that limb before it has healed. In other words, if you have a torn something in your foot or your leg and you're on an unstable surface, you're now putting more stress on that limb. So, you know, my first recommendation is get a good diagnosis. And that, because then you know what you're dealing with. But then the next thing is that while that limb is healing, say it's a tendon, you know, your veterinarian is gonna give you a, a protocol for what to do with that horse for that limb. But the tendency is to only look at that one leg and focus everything on that leg. And there's a whole body and three other legs that are now doing more work. Mm -hmm. So my, my typical response when there's an injury is keep in mind the other legs and use the hard pad or the physio pad with the other legs because they're now taking more stress. Mm -hmm. That'll keep the horse moving in the little micro muscles. It'll keep a level of fitness because he is on an unstable surface, but you're not stressing that limb. And then once the veterinarian has cleared that limb for any kind of a challenge, then you always start with either physio pad or hard, the least unstable pad, because you, know, you don't wanna to offer too much too fast. But it really is important at, through the recovery process. And again, I can't tell you if it's two months, six months, a year, it all depends on the degree of injury and what the veterinarian says. But at some point in time, you really wanna be using Surefoot with all four limbs when that horse is healed because you have to reintegrate that leg back into the whole body outline, the whole body picture. So, you know, it's a real process. And, um, you know, different, like if a horse is laminitic, that's a whole different story because we're sore and you wanna make them feel better and you can use the surefoot pads and I'll use either uh, soft or hard depending on how the laminitis is or slants. And you can go ahead and use that with a laminitic horse, but with a, like a tendon injury, a ligament injury, you really need that solid diagnosis before you start working with that limb. But remember the other three. <clears throat> and so there's a couple of thoughts here. One is how can you secure the environment for the horse from their back, especially when you're hacking? Um, any horse speak applications that you're doing with a horse, it's recommended that you learn what this is, what this is talking about from the ground first so they can see your body language because we have terrible accents most of the time <laughs> so you want to be practicing um these kinds of communication where the horse can actually see you so that if you're doing something funny you don't realize they can you can adjust because they they do a response you didn't expect or whatever and when they when you get it right they they let go they tend to just go 
thanks. You know, they, they are looking for that kind of leadership. So when you can provide it 99% of the time, horses are like, great. And then you just, now you know what it's like. So you can do the same thing while you're sitting up there because it's the same breath. It's the same feeling in your body. You might even pair it with words. So you might every time say, you stay there, tree, or so, you know, so you, you have the same language that you use every time. Um, how about a couple, there's somebody asking about laminitis, uh, a pony recovering from laminitis. And so um, with Surefoot pads, uh, a lot of times the firm slants are really, really helpful with that recovery. Um, again, if it's acute, if it depends, like Daisy Vicking pointed this out, she said, if it's the soul, you want to use, if soul pain, you want to use hard. And if it's wall pain, you want to use soft. So there's a little difference there depending on where the pain is. And then um, somebody else has asked about a five-year-old with very poor body awareness that's surprised when he steps off the pad. So with those horses, if I'm at all thinking they might be surprised, I pick up their foot and take them off the pad. I physically ask them to lift their leg, kick the pad out of, out of the way and put the leg back down so that they don't feel that bit of squish as they step off. And I would make sure that I'm using the physio pad, which is the lowest profile pad, so that there's not going to be a lot of squish. So, you know, you go to your harder pad or your physio pad and literally I take the foot off. Yeah. I would, uh, that's, that's the next question that I came up for me too. And so I was going to hand it to you. So I'm glad you took yeah, it. Yeah. And I do that. I'll do that a few times, right? I'll just uh, pick up their leg and take it up until I see that they're like starting to recognize wh what the pad felt like. And mm -hmm. then when they do step off, I make sure that when I do ask them that there's, they have a lot of open space. That's really, really important. And I don't worry about which way they go. I don't worry about if it's forward, backwards, sideways. I just and I wait, you know, I'll ask them and I'll wait to see if they can figure it out. If they can't figure it out, I'll just take their foot off. Um, and then they don't have that experience. Um, right. They have the positive experience of what it feels like. So Sharon, it's always fun to have you look at a video. So what if I pop up a video and you kind sure. of tell us what the horse is saying? It's, uh, this is always one of my favorite parts. <laughs> so I think this is in uh, New Zealand. Okay. Okay. When were you in New Zealand? I uh, last October. Nice. Yep. It's like when did you travel? <laughs> yeah. A year ago. When did you get to go somewhere? Yeah. Mmm. It's very, very interesting facial expressions, huh? Yeah. And you know what I love about this video. Uh, is that she stepped off really carefully, but she then, you know, she got a little distracted there, but she really stood there and you could see, again, when we're talking about that processing time. Um, yeah. This goes and on. Actually, the, the distraction, the looking away from what I call, I, I call that the sentry look. Um, it, it's really, you'll see horses do that when they're wondering if it's safe to go there into their process. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, when, when, when we were in Germany, we were with the wild tarpon, when there, when there was an elder of the herd, so there was many, like there's 400 horses. And so there was like, I don't know, 30 micro herds that were kind of all together. And when there was an elder of the herd who was lying down, the other horses would all stand around her. So the whole herd would stand, not eat and stand around her so she could take a load off and actually lie down and get some sleep. So it's really important for horses to know that those who are around them are watching out for them so they can go there and get into a deeper process. So it's not uncommon for a horse who's starting to go into a really deep process to suddenly go, are there any boogeyman around here? And, and so at that moment, just kind of secure, you, you don't even have to blow sentry, like the big sentry breath. You could just look where they're looking, then look back at them and kind of give an all clear gesture, like you can put your palm down, you can drop your head, you can relax, you know, do some relaxing motion and a big sigh out and just be like, I looked, I think it's okay. And oftentimes that's enough for the horse to go, oh, thanks for looking for me so I can go deeper. Cause she's pretty deep here. It that's was, seemed like when she moved off, her ear went to the horse coming toward her. So mm -hmm. I felt like it seemed like that she was just like, I can't go any deeper because this pony is coming behind Or whatever me. is yeah. happening over there. Right. But you're right about this horse, that she was a, a sentry type horse. And this coming into the arena, that's one of the reasons we worked with her is because she 
it's very alert and doesn't necessarily let down well. So it's mm -hmm. interesting because you can see that there's processing going on in terms of letting down, but there's, there's the conflict, if you will, between I've got to be a sentry, I'm feeling yes. something different, you know, which way do I go? Yeah, I'd love to go into this is what this horse is saying. I'd love to drop in deeper, but I need to know that the environment is safe and I don't have to, you often find sentry horses are also watching out for the benefit of the other horses. Right. So another horse being ridden is going to make a sentry horse be like, is that horse okay? Okay, are, we, okay? are we okay? <laughs> we have to share this one just because of the conversation today. Um, this one's for you, Laura. Thank you. Are there chickens in it? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yay. <laughs> what a handsome boy. Yeah. Oh, he was very handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the balance trail for people, but today yeah. it was for a chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Did he get on it? Um, he did at times. Yeah, he got on the pads. That's awesome. Awesome. It's, uh, so yeah, I'm just awesome. randomly looking at videos that um, you know, I haven't looked at. In uh, let me just stop and reshare because sometimes it doesn't follow me. Um, you know, Wendy, our our blind horse. Um, she went through a really tough summer. This summer, uh, her her good eye. She she hit it on something. Oh, and, she, and it ulcerated, and so then she was really in trouble for a while. And she also had a um, an abscess in one of her hooves. And so, what what's interesting is that you know when she was ready to use, we she only needed one surefoot pad session, and she was like over it. Oh, nice. It was you know pretty awesome. So, so this is kind of interesting with this horse because to me it looks like she's trying to let something go, but she can't quite. Right. And I, I also, you know, just because I have, I know people who do the natural balance dentistry, so I've gotten a little clued into balance set of teeth and all that stuff. And there's a lot of resetting going on. And I'm also wondering, the horse looks like it's trying to stretch the jaw forward and that and that's dealing with hyoid yeah. and so I'm, I'm in the shake off there and stuff is like the set of the head on the, the set of the head on the neck bone so like the the atlas and the occipital and the set of the hyoid underneath both of those things seem like that that kind of motion right so I'm, i feel like this horse is trying to like get a new set on the the jaw and the head and the teeth and the balance and it's like well my body feels better but boy my head's on funny yeah and you know it's so interesting because because there's a lot that happens after they've stepped off the pads and again i think that goes back to that processing time we you know there's the moment when they're on the pads we might see things but it's really important to give them the time when they come off like that horse, like both of those horses actually right um, because their time, every horse's time of processing is different. And I think in general, especially in the beginning, they need more time. Our tendency to rush horses, I think, because we've got busy schedules, we've got to get to the barn, we've got to get it done, you know, moving on. It tends to, um, you know, uh, this is where I love Lucinda. She's like, we're running a hundred thoughts through our head and they're still back on a... Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, but we're thinking in time. We think in time and they mm -hmm. don't think in time. Yeah, so someone's asking the, the head nod. Can you interpret a horse nodding yes rapidly? Wow, I think it would really depend on what the rest of the picture looked like. Right, um, yeah, because you can, you, it could be an emotional response to something, which is you know, high or low, like a, a, a fear response or an aggressive response or a stress response, or it could be a physiological response to something where they're just like, my head's not on straight, my, my, I got too, my jaw's tight like TMJ, or my teeth are funny and I can't use them right, or, you know, so, something physiological is going on, and it could be a combo. It can also be sometimes um, a mental confusion, mental stress. Horses will often block their neck like we yeah. do. We get yeah. like stiff in the neck when we're not processing information. And then as they start to open that up, you'll get some of this movement, which is not the same as a uh, weaving or something that's sort of neurotic, but it's more like opening. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what came before, uh, what is what seems to be happening when it's occurring and what happened next. So because we think in time, you need to go back and think what happened first, what happened while it was happening, what happened after it happened. 
And when you can do that, you're more likely to have an, a clue. You'll be at least in the ballpark of probably what was going on. Right. And context is everything. Because like with that horse there, one might say, oh, she's just yawning. But to me, there's something she's trying to let go of. There's something yeah. she felt something different. She's trying to move it through. It's kind of getting a little stuck. Yeah. Um, yeah. Versus, you know, yawnings that are nervous yawns, yawning that are relaxing yawns. It's right. so contextual. So somebody's asking, uh, with a yearling, uh, when a yearling paws with its leg during training, does it mean, what is it, I guess, what does it mean and how should one handle it? Well, that, that comes all the way back to horses in training below the, a level, below the age of four. Um, <clears throat> typically, front legs have to do with uh, uh, eagerness to either move, change position. I don't like the position I'm in, I wanna change this, so I'm uncomfortable. Uh, front legs are also used to determine hierarchy. So a horse will block another horse putting the front mm -hmm. leg there. Just by putting the leg there, I've blocked you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they might also move a leg back, say, I've unblocked you, you're free to go. You can go there if you want to. So horses use front feet to determine hierarchy and spatial context. They use hind feet more to, to express emotional content. So they'll kick it themselves or, or stomp a hind foot or relax a hip, cock a hip, to, to do different emotional displays. So that tends to be what it is. So if a, you've got a young horse who's going eh, 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 it's like, I need, to, I need to go somewhere else. What I'm doing right now, what's happening right now is stressing me out and I don't wanna be here, this is too much. So that's really what that is. And of course we've blocked forward motion. Usually we've said, you can't leave. You have to do the thing, whatever the thing is. And so then this is, but I, this is the only outlet that they have to just express that like, I'm really stressed out about where I am and what's going on right now. And I'd like to leave it. It's not striking necessarily. It could evolve into striking. Uh, and it's not rearing or kicking or, or lashing out necessarily in a negative way, but it is a way for a horse to say, this is really stressing me out. Okay, you guys forced me to make a video of my horses meeting the barn cat the first night in the new barn last November. Hope it downloads. Yeah, well, and some point can just be a level of frustration. I have that mm -hmm. one horse and, and it's so interesting because he's the very, very pushy horse and he's um, been allowed for 17 years to his, his previous owner, always backed off. And so now when I bring him in, I, you know, it's like you have to politely put your head in to take your halter off and know you can't have your food right away until you, sh you show me that, right? And there, it's a very repeating pattern and there's always a moment where he paws. It's so habitual and then he comes out of it and then he's like, look and show, okay, yeah, you got it. You, you're in Right, right, right. And that's different because he's an older horse. Yeah. Yes. So relative to a, a younger horse, and Lucinda probably went over this, but, um, According to the research that's out there on horse brains, their, their brains are completely devoted to proprioception. It's completely devoted to the cerebellum until they're between three and four years old. So they don't even have capacity to like mingle in herd hierarchy. Like between three and four is when a horse is really finding out who they are, finding their place in a herd you know, gaining some hierarchy standing. And where they can start to learn. Right, and Dr. where they're Peters, able to learn. Dr. Stephen Peters goes into a lot about the development where he's finding that the balance is so important to them at the younger ages that their brain isn't capable of learning anything till three or four. Right, so they're doing things by rote, but they're not understanding this. They're not processing it. They don't even have the capacity to process it, which is why horses, being raised by other horses are actually pretty light with their youth. Like I've seen young horses do incredible, like, you know, to, to elders and the elders just go, uh, you know, and kind of give them some leeway. They might call it at, at some, sometimes they put their foot down and say, that's enough. But most of the time they're incredibly lenient with the young, the young whippersnappers. And of course we want horses to have good manners. So when I've worked with, um, when I've worked with young or baby horses, there's a lot that has to do with just my space, your space. That's all, just, we're just gonna repeat my space, your space, and I'm going to encourage low calorie conversations, quiet moments, and, and leave early and quick. Yeah. So lots and lots and lots of little things that's about our space, end soon, have it be positive, and don't expect them to learn much, because even if it looks like they're learning, 
and you might have experienced this, Wendy, I've certainly experienced it in rescues, where a horse was trained up and then they, they hit like three, four, five years old and they fell apart. Yep. Because they didn't actually learn, learn anything. Yep. And I, you know, that's, I hate to say it, but I think that's why futurities are at three and not four. four. You can't push around a four-year-old. Mm. Push around a three-year-old. You can, you know, shove them through an incredible amount of pressure and they kind of survive it. But, you know, when you get to four and five, they start becoming teenagers and they go through even geldings through puberty. <laughs> And, you know, their, their sense of self. And I, I mean, I watched Allie was so funny because he turned six and suddenly he was very interested in girls, whereas they were so icky before that. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, you know, gelded really early, but suddenly he's like, oh, I am the best thing. And, you know, and he had this moment, you know, 15 moments of fame where he was really interested in the girls. And then it lasted about that long. Like, poof. <laughs> but he was like, eh, too much work. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> he puff himself up and... I just laughed. It was really funny. But the mares, you know, I've I've seen mares. They they all go through a a, a pubescent phase mm -hmm. around between four and six, and so you know they really aren't. They're like little kids. They're not really processing stuff. You just want to keep them safe, have it fun, keep it short, um, and not ex have great expectations uh, because physically they're not mature either. I mean, yeah. way not mature. My horse, I got my horse and she, I didn't know any of this stuff yet, Dakota. And she was trained up. She was two years old, trained up. Uh, and, and then at round three, she actually had a series of unfortunate events and kept breaking. Mm. So she, she was on stall rest more often than not. Uh, and then we start finally riding her again between four and five. And it was like, wasn't this horse trained? <laughs> yeah. Did she learn how to be... Why is this, why is all this happening? And it was really interesting. I mean, some stuff was definitely like, it wasn't the first time she put a saddle on, but it was very interesting to just be like, well, I guess we're starting over. You know, and that was my, my first blush with like, oh, there's this thing, it's called puberty in horses. Yeah. And it, you know, it's, when you've been around enough of them, you, you, you really recognize it. And it's like, but it's like teenage kids, suddenly their, their whole focus is shifted. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, so yeah, it's just important. And it's important to realize during that phase, you just have to kind of work with it a bit. You don't want to confront it head on because it's a lot of hormones, even in geldings, you know, behind it. And it's just kind of managing it until they kind of, you know, clears it. They do uh, come to the other side. Yeah. Yes, they do. They do. And if you've had a good solid base beforehand, they're going to be the same horse on the other side, but it, there is this moment. Um, the Carolyn did share her pictures. I can pull them up if you want to see horse cat greeting and i think that'll be a good place for us to kind of wrap it up bookends Book yeah there we go we've got the kitty coming across oh uh, wow yep. and uh yeah oh, that's there's awesome. touching yeah nice kitty. greetings that's super cool yeah, I love those oh there you go <laughs> there it is <laughs> yep <laughs> That My is... cat, Rondo, who loves Jag, and she actually, if the horses have blankets on, a couple of our horses don't get a really good winter coat. So Rondo will jump up on there and mm -hmm. hang out. Those black cats are so special. Something about them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All well, right. guys, this has been a, another uh, blowing through an hour really rapidly and having a great wow. time. Um, thank you so much. And we'll have you guys back again in a couple of weeks because, you know, I mean, it's just, I, it's always so interesting where we go in our conversation. <laughs> Oh, never yeah. a dull moment. No. Never and never the same twice. So yeah. just remember, you can watch this and all the other Sharon Wilsey um, webinars. I've made a playlist actually. So oh. you, yeah, you can just go to the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel, go to the playlist. You can pull up all the Wilsey webinars along with me. Um, and I've categorized them, starting to categorize them like by by um, guest, and then some of them by category like hoofs, because we've had a lot of people that um, have talked about hooves and that sort of thing or fascia. So. Yeah. Um, just go there and subscribe. You'll get a notice every time we put up another webinar. And um, tomorrow we're going to talk about bits and bidding. So that should be interesting. Mm. Nice. And Heidi, something I want to put out Heidi, there. Wendy. Sorry. sorry. Oh my God. Why, like, why does that do that? Uh, Heidi, I always want to. That must be your alter ego yeah. is Heidi. In another dimension, <laughs> I know you as Heidi. I'm so sorry. So in all seriousness, at some point when people can get together again, yeah. um, I would love to somehow, some way, set up like a, a holistic horse expo oh what yeah no i you know that's been 
that that's been in the back of my mind for years and um it, we might even we might even kind of play with that a little bit virtually mm. in, in anticipation of setting it up in live um just because the um the administrative side of it can get pretty intense when you're bringing a lot of people together but yeah, right. um yeah we got this there's, there's a lot of positive comments coming in on that one um yeah. we actually Years and years ago, back in the 90s, Joyce and I had Whole Horse, Whole Rider as a title. Um, and so what, maybe we can resurrect that one and, uh, and look at that. But um, yeah. certainly something worth considering. And again, maybe something we start virtually um, just because we can work out some of the logistics that way first and get it to you, you know, while the pandemic is still going on. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad idea to do a virtual. Um, we've been yeah. a part of a couple of virtual clinics Over in, in, in Germany. Germany. So that's been... Yeah. No, still All right. So we away. have a lot to talk about. I guess we're going to have to have like a Zoom meeting, just you and I, you, th the three of us, yeah. do some planning stuff. Yeah, no, the four yeah. of us, because Heidi has to be there too, right? Because oh. you're Heidi. <laughs> my my <laughs> other Heidi, <laughs> yeah, the one in the back. <laughs> other you. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's Heidi right there over my shoulder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you to all of our guests today for coming and spending the hour with us. It's always great to see all the comments and where everyone's from. It's just like so much gratitude for y'all that you know, be, believe in Wendy Murdoch. And if you're into riding horses, she also is a great riding instructor. Too. Yes. Not just the sure fat pad sure, things. Not sure fat, sure foot. Not sure foot pads. Yeah, sure actually, pads. we have an online course, uh, Effortless Rider. I don't know when we're going to launch it again, but what, yeah, well, um, we'll be sending out notices when we do. Yeah. Awesome. All right. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Have a great day. Be well. Bye. Bye.